Hi everyone, my name is Chrissy Nichols and I have the extreme privilege of being a faculty member here at Stark College and Seminary. Today, as you can see, we are going to talk about drafting your paper. Now, I'm only going to touch very, very, very briefly on some of the stuff that happens before you draft your paper. Picking your topic, writing a killer thesis statement, figuring out the outline, what in the world is Turabian. We're going to talk very briefly about that. And if that's not enough and you want to learn more about that, first of all, awesome. Good job. I'm so proud of you. And second of all, you can find links to other YouTube videos not made by me but other YouTube videos that talk about how to do those sorts of things, it'll be down in the description box below this video. But first, we're going to talk again very, very, very briefly about picking your topic. And these are just a list of questions that I got from Turabian, proper citation, um, that talk about um, just ways to pick your topic. So these are questions you can ask yourself. I'm not going to read them all to you. I am very confident in your ability to read. But these are just things like, yeah, what do you know something about? What are you interested in? And honestly, all of these questions could be boiled down to what is something that really, really interests you that is appropriate to write about for your class? Because honestly, y'all, if you aren't interested in the topic you have to write about, you are not going to want to write it. Like, you can have all of the best tools. I could be the best teacher ever. But if you aren't interested in your research topic, guess what? It is going to be like pulling teeth to get it done. So do yourself a favor. Take this very first step in picking a topic that you think you can be excited about, that you think you're going to be interested about. And that's going to help you a whole lot in writing your paper. The next thing to think about, and again, there's just so much I could say about thesis statements. In my research and writing class, I spend an entire class period talking about thesis statements, and I'm going to spend like less than 30 seconds talking about them right now. Um, a thesis statement is essentially a roadmap to your paper. It is the thing that comes at the end of your introduction that tells your reader this is what you have to expect. This is what my paper is about. This is the focus of my paper. This is why my paper matters. And this is what you can look forward to in my paper. Right here on this slide, I do have a couple of lists. On the one side, I have the list of things that a thesis statement does. Um, a thesis statement does include my topic. A thesis statement tells my reader what the position that I'm taking on my topic is. And my thesis statement should have at least a couple, not very detailed, but just some reasons that support my position on my topic. And then a thesis statement should have, and you'll notice these are very closely intertwined, but a thesis statement should have your topic. So if you're writing about a verse of the Bible, that address, like Deuteronomy 6.4 or whatever you're writing on, that should be in the thesis statement. Deuteronomy 6 colon 4, that should be in there somewhere. If you're writing about Lottie Moon, her name should for sure be in your thesis statement somewhere. Um, you also want to have your purpose. Is it to inform? Is it to persuade? Now, every paper, as you will learn when you take research and writing, every paper is an argument of some sort. But the thesis statement should specifically say whether it is an argument just meant to inform. I'm just making points that inform the reader of something he or she may or may not have known. Or is it to persuade? Is it to say, I know that this is a controversial topic, and I'm going to take this position, and I am going to persuade you, who may have held the opposite position, as to why my position is correct. Does it have the focus? Does it tell me why this is important? Does it have specific language? Do I know who you're talking about? Do I know when your topic is covered? Do I know where specifically you're talking about. Are you talking about, for example, Christians all over the world? Or are you focusing on Christians in South Texas? Or maybe you're talking about missionaries in East Asia. 
be specific in your thesis statement so your reader isn't left wondering, what in the world is this paper about? And then, of course, you can have the subdivisions to your paper. Occasionally, this will be a separate sentence, but really canny writers will manage to work the subdivisions of their paper, the essentially the outline of their paper, into their thesis statement in a really fun and crafty way. And then, so you've picked your topic, you've written a fantastic, detailed, beautiful thesis statement, and now it's time to write your outline. I highly recommend writing an outline, especially if you aren't very used to writing. Outlines can be so, so helpful. Right here, I have included the basic outline to every paper you will ever write with the possible exception of book reviews. Those are kind of their own animal, but even those you could say fit into this outline. So here at Start College and Seminary, we use what is called the Turabian format, which is based on Chicago humanities. You can talk to me one-on-one -on -one if you want to know more about it. I can talk for a while about Miss Kate. Um, but in Turabian, especially in class papers, we include a cover page. Um, I will show you where you can find an example of that here in just a second. You also, so after your cover page, your very first page of your actual paper needs to start with an introduction. And in the introduction, as a former teacher of mine used to say, you tell them what you're going to tell them. This is where your thesis statement is. This is where the outline of your paper is. This is where you really introduce your topic to your reader. So you tell them what you're going to tell them. After your introduction, you have your body where you tell them. This is where you really lay out your argument. You make your points, you give good support for your points, you make sure your sources are scholarly, and this is where you really do put, put it all out there. This is where it is. And then after you've done that, and nobody could possibly argue with you about or against what you've said, your claim has been essentially proven, your thesis statement has shown itself to be absolutely true, you wrap it up with a conclusion where you tell them what you told them. Your introduction and your conclusion should be pretty closely related. I like to say they reflect one another or they're kind of, um, they mirror each other a little bit. And then after you've told them, tell them what you're, you've told them what you told them already, <laughs> you have your bibliography, which is where you put all of your citations. This is where you say this is exactly like the publication and the title and the author and all of that of my book. Um, and so this is the basic outline for what pretty much every single paper you write in seminary is going to look like. And also what your a lot of your papers are going to look like even if you're writing for a different topic or a different venue. Um, and I know this can be a little daunting just to look at this because you're like, I don't even know what that's supposed to look like in practice. Um, don't worry. I, well, we at Start College and Seminary have provided you with some resources on the library website, which you can get to by going to stark.edu slash library. That's also going to be one of the many links below in the description box. I have some resources here and you will see on the right hand side where it says additional resources and one of them there is the SCS research paper example. You can click on that, it's a PDF and it is an example of what a research paper should look like. The example has a table of contents, all of your papers may not include a table of contents, but if it does, Here's a way so that you know what it's supposed to look like. Um, this is also going to show you sort of what we're expecting as far as footnotes and bibliography entries and all of that is supposed to look like. So please don't stress out so much about, I don't know what my paper is supposed to look like. Take a deep breath. You'll be okay. And go check out the research paper example on the SCS library website. So... We've done all of this. We have a thesis statement that reflects a just so interesting topic, just a fascinating topic. We have outlined our paper, maybe a little skeletal outline, but we have an outline that we can work off of. Now it's time to get to what I consider to be the fun part, actually sitting down 
and writing your paper. I'm going to talk about eight steps, eight tools that we can use as we write our paper. Um, we're going to go over each of these in detail. Again, I'm not going to read them all to you right now. I am very, very confident in your ability to read these. And like I said, we're going to go over them one by one. So the very first thing that honestly should come first whenever you're sitting down to actually write your paper and flesh out your outline and make everything beautiful and start to see the words come together is to draft in a way that feels the most comfortable. And I mean this in a few different ways. So like, first of all, I'm talking about physical comfort. This doesn't mean you have to have a perfect ergonomic chair, a keyboard that has one of those fluffy things to go under your wrists to make writing just a delightful physical experience. Um, those are great. If you have those, like awesome, use them if that's what works for you. For some people, the most comfortable way to write is to sit in a big fluffy armchair, put their legs underneath them, put their laptop in their lap or kind of perched on the arm and write that way. Um, it would kill my back, but for some of you, that's going to be the thing that works best. And so find a way that is physically comfortable for you to write in. Because if you are physically uncomfortable, you're just going to sit there and be like, I'm not comfortable. I don't feel good. I don't like this. My back hurts. My hip hurts. My arm hurts. And you're not going to want to write your paper. So make sure you're physically comfortable. The next thing is to find a comfortable settings. Uh, and I like to say that you need to have the right amount of distractions and noise. For some people, this is absolute silence. Like you have to seal yourself in a soundproof room and or put on your noise canceling headphones and be focused and get it done. For other people, you'll go absolutely bonkers if that's the way you sit down and try to write a paper. So maybe you'll put on like a TV show that you've seen 800 times or maybe you want to go to a coffee shop and Find a seat that there's just, there's that little wonderful like coffee shop, like the chatter and the sound of the espresso machine. And maybe that just really does it for you and you can focus and that's a comfortable setting for you. Whatever it is, find a setting, find a, a physical like place in the universe that is a comfortable place for you to draft from. And then finally, you want to draft in an order that is comfortable. Um, I tell people too, like, we live in the 21st century. You don't have to start with the introduction and then work your way through the body and then get to your conclusion and then write out your bibliography. We have copy and paste. It is super easy to, like, select paragraphs and move them around or to say, well, I'm going to type up here and then, oh, well, I'm going to work here and then I'm going to work here. Um, some people really like to write the conclusion first. For them, that is the part where they're wrapping it up, where they can really get their head around what is coming in the rest of the paper. For other people, the introduction and the conclusion are the very last things they write. Um, some people, like I actually tend to write it from top to bottom, but I know I don't have to. And for you, that may not work. So make sure that you just draft in a way that is comfortable for you as far as like what order you're writing in. Then once you've found a way you're comfortable, you're not like physically stressed by your position, you can concentrate because you have the right amount of noise and distractions, you've decided I'm going to start with this part of my paper first because that's what makes the most sense to me, you need to develop some productive drafting habits. So first of all is time. You want to make sure that you have carved out enough time total first of all um, and then also you want to set aside time in a way that works for you I have a friend who likes to sit down and she will write a page a day so if she has like a 15 page research paper she'll do all of the background work she'll have all of her research done she'll have a thesis statement she'll have an outline but then about 16 or 17 days before it's due she'll sit down and she'll write a page and then she'll go do something else, and then the next day she'll sit down and she'll write a page. And that really works for her. I can't do that 
partly because I have bad time management skills <laughs> and partly because just writing a page at a time feels really weird to me. So I'll write two or three pages at a time. Um, I still want to start early enough that I have time for things like editing and all of that. But as far as like setting aside time, I want to carve out enough time and I want to carve it into chunks that make sense for me. Next is when you sit down to work on your draft, you want to make sure that you are actually working on your draft. It is so easy. I was talking earlier about the benefits of the 21st century being that we can kind of move around where we're writing. One of the downfalls is the fact that our computers don't just have our word processing on them. Um, they've also got Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and Reddit and whatever you're into, YouTube. And so it's so easy when we sit down to be like, I'm going to start on my draft in a little bit <laughs> and then not actually start on our drafts. So when we sit down, we want to make sure that we are actually working on your draft. I'm not saying you can't take breaks. I love to take breaks. I like to reward myself with breaks. Um, but if you do need to take breaks, you want to like set goals to meet and then make sure you meet them before you actually take them. And sort of on the flip side of that is, at least I've experienced this, where I'll set a goal and I'll be like, okay, I'm going to get to this end of this page and then I'm going to scroll Instagram for five minutes because that makes me happy. And I'll get to the end of the page, but I've kind of built up steam. Like I said, I like to write multiple pages in a chunk. So I'll get to the end of the page and I'll be like, you know what? I'm going to keep going. Maybe I'll take a break at the end of the next page. So it's so easy to be like, well, I said I was going to take a break, but please don't let that stop you if you've started to get some momentum uh, and just keep going and keep working on your draft and don't get distracted. The next thing that really helps me with working on a draft is to use some keywords and to use a research outline. Now, keywords are words that are typically used in notes. So whenever you are looking through your sources and you're doing your research, uh, a really good habit to get into is to take notes on those things. So to write down for yourself, like on three by five note cards, or I'll use Google Slides, just some way to have notes so that I know, okay, in this source, you know, it talked about the person, maybe the Bible character I'm writing about, or it. this talks a lot about the setting. Sometimes I'll have multiple notes on the same source because I'll have, from one source, I'll have the part where they talk about the setting, and then I'll also have the part where they maybe really dug into what this one word means in its original context. So I'll have multiple notes, and I'll put keywords at the top of those. Then, when I get to the point where I'm drafting my paper, I can use those keywords to organize my paper. I can put all of the stuff about the setting together, and I can put all of the stuff about that one particular word together. So I can know, okay, I can use these to know, okay, on this section I have enough stuff, but on this one, it looks like I only have one note. So maybe I need to go do a little more research. Or just to help me know um, if I have too much research, because <laughs> that'll happen to me too. I'll be like, I have, 13 of my sources talk about this, and I have stuff on all of them. So to be able to put it all together, and instead of just saying, well, this one says something about it, to be able to say, oh, right, this one had really good information about it. So you want to use your keywords to help organize your paper. And you also want to use your research outline. Um... I've talked about the research outline a lot. Like I said, I think it's really important, especially if you aren't very confident in writing a paper. A research outline is going to go a long way in helping you write your paper. I was just talking to someone today who was saying how he was so lost on writing a paper one time, but then someone had told him to make an outline. And he made the outline, and then as soon as he finished the outline, he's like, oh, yeah, I know what I'm writing about now. So a research outline is just so important, and it's a guideline that you've created for yourself. I like to think of it, um, it's a little eerie maybe <laughs> to think of it this way, as like a skeleton, a bare skeleton. And my actual paragraphs are just fleshing out the skeleton so that when I'm done, I have a whole like person there. Um, 
But I don't want you to also feel like you're constrained by your outline. I know for me, I've outlined my paper before and then I'm really into it and I'm like, you know what? These two things really should be switched. Like they just work better here or I'll have it organized in a certain way and then I'll be like, wait a second, that organization didn't work. Like maybe instead of going chronologically, I should go by subject. That's just going to work a lot better for my paper. So don't feel constrained by your outline, but even having an outline that you end up not following that closely at least gets you started with writing your paper. The next thing is to quote, paraphrase, and summarize appropriately. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this uh, because it's important. And because as the librarian and as someone who teaches research and writing, these things are really important to me. So first of all, you want to summarize when the details are irrelevant or the source isn't important enough to require space. So Maybe you have a source that kind of talks about like a general idea and you really like the general idea, but you feel like the exact quotations or like the details just don't don't matter. They don't support or detract from your claim. Um, you can just summarize it, but you still want to quote it. You still want to cite that you used it, but you can just summarize it. You don't have to put too much space in your paper to that. And then you do want to paraphrase. So maybe you're saying, okay, you know, the details are important and I need to include them, but this whole sentence is kind of long and unwieldy or the grammar just isn't working for my paper, whatever it is, where you can take whatever is in your original source and reword it and figure out a way to say it better and, again, include some of those details. Now you want to quote for these purposes. So when the words constitute evidence that back up your reasons, that is when you would want to include a direct quotation. And when I say what I mean here is when the words themselves back up your reasons. Um, sometimes it does matter. I know someone was talking about baptism one time and they used the word necessary and as a just a person, a Baptist person, I was like, baptism is important. But, uh, you know, necessary, like, for salvation, I was like, so if I was quoting that, I would make sure to definitely use a direct quote because the place I have a problem with is in that specific word, necessary. Also, when the author just said it in a way that you can't say it better. They said it and it was completely clear. It was very tightly and beautifully packaged. And you can't do it better. So in that case, you might include a direct quotation. You still would probably, paraphrasing is technically better than quoting as far as like standards go. Um, but sometimes it's just, it's a beautiful phrase. I love beautiful phrases. And sometimes you just come across a beautiful phrase in a source and you need to include the direct quotation. Sometimes you need to use a direct quotation when you disagree and you want to state the passage exactly, like I said earlier about that word necessary. Um, I would quote it because I need to exactly say that word. I need to exactly include that phrase. And if I didn't use a direct quotation, it wouldn't pack as much of a punch whenever I negate it. And then finally, you can use a quotation when the passage comes from an authority that backs up your view. So if it's from somebody like one of the church fathers, like Augustine, and again, he kind of says it this way, and the fact that these are Augustine's words, or the fact that these, if you're like a big into N.T. Wright, these are N.T. Wright's words, um, and the way that he said it really matters, that's when you would want to use a direct quotation. But if these things aren't really the case, paraphrasing is actually better. Now, another part of quoting, paraphrasing, and summarizing appropriately is that you want to integrate your quotations. So you can do that by using an independent sentence introduced by a few words, or you can kind of weave the grammar of the quotation into the grammar of your sentence. The second one is much nicer. It's much harder to do. So here is just an example. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said is the um, few words that introduce it. I am the way, the truth, and the life is the quotation. 
Then you could also say, because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, therefore there is no other way, you know, whatever the rest of your sentence is. One of my pet peeves, and I know other professors may not care as much, but this really matters to me, is that you don't plop quotes. Uh, this is not a technical term, okay? This is a term coined by one of my former teachers who I don't even remember who I heard it from the first time, which is terrible as far as, like, citations go, because I should remember. But a plopped quote is a quote that just sits in a sentence all by itself. You shouldn't start a sentence with a quotation, okay? Um, if the whole sentence is the quotation, you should probably maybe paraphrase it or try to introduce it. Uh, you want it to be a part of your argument. Papers, the papers that you write, they need to be your words. They need to be your argument. They need to be your claims. So even whenever you bring in people from other sources, you want to make sure that it's still you who is saying this. And if you just plop a quote in there, it becomes what somebody else said and not what you said. So please, please don't plop quotes. It makes me sad. Um, and here's a few more examples. So this construction here, this so-and-so explains that, it, it's not terrible, but it's not great either. If you can't think of any other way to incorporate your quotation, it'll work. But every single quotation in your paper should not start with so-and-so says that. If we want to know who said it, we can look down in the footnotes. I have an example of a footnote here. So you can just say, you know, a scholar explains that light, blah, blah, blah. And then if I can see the little one and I can look down at the bottom of the page and I can see, oh, Michael Wilkins said that. Because whenever you just say, you know, Wilkins says that, like who the heck is Wilkins? I don't know who Wilkins is. Um, why does the fact that he said it matter? Uh, if I, if it's somebody who's like super important, again, I know I use Augustine a lot, but we love Augustine here in the West. We love Augustine. So if Augustine said it, you can say, well, Augustine said this. And that's going to pack a punch. But just some theologian who your professor may or may not even be familiar with, just because they said it, doesn't mean anything. So try not to use this construction unless it's like absolutely necessary. You want to include something more like this, where I talk about, you know, Jesus' use of light. And this verse continues a the theme in all of the Bible, where light is normally emphasizing the removal of darkness and the unfolding biblical history and theology. And again, I've got my little footnote, and if I wanted to know, if your professor wanted to know who the heck said that, who in the world said that, they can look down and they can be like, oh, Michael Wilkins said that in a Zondervan commentary on Matthew. That's very interesting. But you don't have to tell me all of that in the body of your paper. Your professor would appreciate not to read, so-and-so said this, and so-and-so said this, every single time you use a quotation. Okay, this is a way of weaving the grammar all throughout, like I had talked about, where I have a piece here and a piece here, and it's just, it kind of feels like my words, but it's actually Wilkins' words. This is just another example of it. And then at the bottom, you can see an example of a shortened quotation, by the way, or shortened citation. So if you want to know a little bit more about Turabian, the very first time in a paper you use a source, you use it like this. It's got the name, the title, the publication information, the page you got it from. The second, third, fourth, eighteenth time you use it in your paper, you need it to look like this, where you have just the name, the person who, the title of the book, and the page number, and that's it. And it's super easy. So don't let anybody tell you Turabian's too hard. It's not too hard. <sighs> And then again, uh, this is kind of like the bottom of the barrel way to incorporate a quotation. Like I said, please don't do this. But if this is the only thing you can think to do and the other option would be to plop the quote, do this. <laughs> don't plop the quote. But this is just like a teeny tiny step above plopping a quote unless it really matters who said it. Um, but this is a construction that you could use. 
So, like I said, this is the very, very bare minimum, bottom of the barrel way to do it. Um, but if you can think of another way to do it, and sometimes this requires a little extra thought. Sometimes in your very first draft, this is what you do. And you don't worry about being that creative because it's your very, very first draft. And you're just trying to get the paper written. So don't stress too much on your first draft about doing this. But please, and your second pass and your third pass, look out for these things and try to fix them. And make them more where you're integrating it, where you have a longer statement to start the quotation. Now we are going to talk a little bit about footnotes and endnotes. Um, we do not use endnotes here at Stark College and Seminary, but some other places do. Some professors might prefer it. Uh, I don't know any, but maybe someone does. Uh, and you do, you want to use them when you should use them to avoid plagiarism, to clear up a point. But don't use them when you don't need to use them. So always use them to cite. But if your paper looks like this nonsense paper I have right here, um, that's a problem. Like most of your paper, especially unless you're like a doctoral student, okay, most of your papers should not be like this. You should have... Um, you should have more of your information and less kind of extraneous stuff. If you are explaining for paragraphs and paragraphs in the footnotes, if it's that important, include it in the body of your paper. Your professors are not stupid, and we know when you are just using footnotes in order to avoid having to write actual content in your paper. So just use them when you should. Always use them when you are saying something that was somebody else's idea first because that's how you avoid plagiarism. But don't just don't just use them to take up space, y'all. We know what you're doing. The next thing is to interpret complex or detailed evidence. So if there is a piece of evidence, which is typically a quotation, a paraphrase, a summary, that's particularly like complex or detailed, you want to take the time to explain it. You don't just want to lay this out there and be like, moving on. Tell your reader, how does this, how does this um, prove your point? How does this relate back to your original claim, your original argument? Um, this is where your warrant and your argument is especially important. So if you have not taken research and writing, you may not know what a warrant is, but a warrant is an explanation of why or how the data supports the claim. It's the underlying, underlying assumption that sub connects your data to your claim. So the warrant is basically the thing that just bridges that gap between this really complicated, kind of confusing quotation or paraphrase or summary and the original point that you are trying to make. So, this is an example you can see in this slide of what a warrant looks like. This last sentence here about how this indicates his own desire to remove darkness from this present age. That's the warrant that interprets this kind of complicated quotation that comes above and says, this is what I'm really trying to say. This is how this complicated quotation really does back up my point. So next, we're at the next to last step. We're almost at the end. Next is to guard against inadvertent plagiarism. Remember, accidental plagiarism is still plagiarism. It still counts. You don't necessarily get like, oh, that's not plagiarism just because you did it on accident. You got to be vigilant. You got to be careful that you aren't passing off somebody else's words or ideas as your own. So I'm going to talk about some different types of inadvertent plagiarism. So the very first type is that you cited a source and you used the exact words, but you failed to put them in quotation marks. This counts for Bible verses. This counts 
for books and journal articles. This counts for anything where you are using the exact same words that somebody else used and you don't have them in quotation marks. Because then how are we supposed to know, how is your reader supposed to know that these aren't your words, that these are somebody else's words? So always, 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 whenever you're using somebody else's words, put them in quotation marks. If you're wondering, like, well, this combination of three words has been used throughout history, um, seven is, like, the rule of thumb as far as plagiarism goes. If you have a string of seven words that is exactly the same as someone else and it is not in quotation marks, that was probably not an accident. Okay, so <laughs> make sure that you are always putting other people's words in quotation marks in your paper. The next kind of plagiarism is that you like paraphrase the source and cited it, but it is too similar to the original. The example I often use for this is just this image I have in my head of a student sitting down to write a paper and they have the source on one side and they have a thesaurus on the other side and every couple words they're looking up on their source and they're just finding it in the thesaurus and replacing it with another word that means the same thing. That's still plagiarism, okay? Because you didn't even try to rearrange their words. You just substituted a couple other words. Um, at that point, just quote them directly and put it in quotation marks and cite it. Um, and then the last one, which is honestly the most basic definition of plagiarism, is that you used ideas or words from a source, but you didn't cite it. All of these are wrong. All of these are plagiarism. Don't do them. Okay. Um, the next, the last thing to help you write your paper, the last sort of step or tip or tool to help you write your paper is to work through procrastination. This is something that I have learned through lots of experience, okay? I am, unfortunately, um, a procrastinator. I tend towards procrastination. I'm working on it, okay? So when I'm saying this stuff, I'm saying it from like a place of understanding, okay? So in my experience, there are two major causes of procrastination. The very first one is that you aren't looking far enough ahead and you forget what assignments are coming up. This happens to me a lot. I just, I didn't see them. And so out of sight, out of mind, I completely forgot I had something due. I wasn't like trying to procrastinate. It just happened. Um, and so that's, for me, that's one of the first ways that procrastination happens. And then the second one is feeling overwhelmed, thinking that you can never finish all that you have. So you don't even try to start on any of it. Um, again, this is this happens to me a lot where I'm just like, I have 8,000 things to do. There's no way I'm going to get all 8,000 done. So I'm not even going to start. I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to whatever, sit here and watch YouTube. <laughs> um, but there are ways to fight it, okay? You don't have to succumb to procrastination. Um, and so first of all, for the very first kind of procrastination, the way you fight that is to get a good planner or to really get a detailed um, entries in Google Classroom or Google um, Calendar. And that's going to help you remember when stuff is coming up. But for the second time, the second kind, which I think is kind of the harder one to get around, is to... First of all, to break your assignments into smaller pieces. Have y'all ever heard of the old adage about the best way to eat an elephant, right? Just one bite at a time. Instead of thinking, I've got to get all of this done. I have these 8,000 things to do. Just think, I have five things to do right now. I'm going to get these five things done. Or I'm going to get this one thing done. If five things is too much, I'm just going to get this one thing done. Then I'm going to take a deep breath. And then I'm going to say, okay, I can get one other thing done. But don't think about all of the things you have to do if that is paralyzing you. Break it into pieces that you think are manageable. Second of all, you want to reward yourself when you finish something 
that you only want to reward yourself when you finish something. Only when you finish something. This is where self-control really comes into play. Because you can say, oh, I'll have a square of chocolate when I finish my research outline. And the chocolate is sitting there and it's staring at you and it's calling your name. And you don't want to do the research outline. You have to resist and say, no, I'm going to finish it and then I will have the sweet reward. And then kind of the last thing is that if something is holding you up, move on. All right, make a note to yourself that you still have to finish that part, but don't let it get stuck. This is a time when something like keywords really help. What I do is I put brackets in my paper and I put my keyboard on all caps. And sometimes I change my font color to bright red highlighted by yellow. And I type, put more here. And then I put a closed bracket and then I move on. And later I will come back and finish it. But if that is making you just so stuck that you don't even want to keep moving, you're just like, whatever, I can't finish this because I can't get past this one part. Remember, we can write all over our papers. Or if your research paper is holding you up and you have homework to do for another class, you have some reading to do, take a break, move on. Go do your reading for your spiritual formation class. Read a little Richard Foster. He, well, sometimes he just convicts you of your sin, but he can also make you feel better. And then later, your brain is going to keep working on it in the background, and you'll come back, and it'll be, it'll be so much easier to write it. So don't let being held up cause you to procrastinate. So, using these eight steps, I do hope that you find writing your paper um, just to be an enjoyable, less stressful than you expected kind of experience, okay? I know that this isn't perfect. I know some of these just seem like common sense, but it really does help. And there's just a couple other things I want to say to you before I go. And first of all, when it comes to writing or comes to doing any kind of work, it's better to do something than to do nothing, especially for both for people who are honestly who are creative and for people who don't feel like they're creative. You can get this feeling like if I can't write it perfectly, I'm not going to write it at all. And I get it. I've been there. I do that. But I say this all the time and it's kind of become a mantra of mine the past couple years. You can edit a badly written page. You cannot edit a blank page. If you are just so stuck and you feel like you can't get the right words out, get the wrong words out. Put whatever you can to just get a muddled, messy, grammatically incorrect, misspelled thought down onto the paper. And then later you can go back and you can work at it and you can file it down and you can shine it up and you can make it look good. But you can't do that with a blank piece of paper, okay? So write something. <laughs> it's better than writing nothing. Um, and second of all, um, I just want to remind you that whenever you're writing a paper or doing any assignment or honestly doing anything, if you feel like you just don't get it, like you have an assignment in front of you and you just don't understand what you are supposed to do, especially here at Stark College and Seminary, y'all don't suffer in silence. Don't just sit there and be like, well, I don't know what to do, so I'm not going to do it. Or even, um, I know I said just write something, but don't just sit there. If you have no idea what you're supposed to do, don't just sit there and be like, well, I guess I'll just do my best. Like, your professors, especially here at Stark, y'all, we care so much about you. We want you to succeed. We want you to do the absolute best you can because we know that you're not just doing it because you want a piece of paper that has your name and has our name and has that you graduated. Like, that's all great, and I'm really excited when y'all graduate, but we know that you're doing it because you're here answering a call from God, and so don't suffer in silence, okay? Ask us for help. Ask us for clarification. Make appointments with us, and we will be so happy to sit down and explain it to you and to try to help you understand, okay? And if you have to ask us 50 times, I can tell you every professor here 
would rather answer your questions 50 times than to have you sit there feeling like you can't do it. Because you can. Because God wouldn't have brought you here if you couldn't do it, okay? So take care of yourselves. I hope you enjoy your future research projects. I hope you go and you listen to my colleagues. Um, their lectures, they're all a lot more theological than mine is. But I hope you um, have a great day. And I hope to see you here at Start College and Seminary. <laughs>